once more. They've said, nope, we know you're pretty good at it. So uh, they're also going to ban away the Talia, which I think is quite interesting, especially seeing as so far this tournament... Uh, oh, of course, earlier in the day, we saw it coming out from Frozen. He did have a great game one with it. So still showing respect towards it there. But also, it was one of the comfort picks for Marfs that he brought out uh, during the group stage. There's the Jarvan removed, and now Team 1 have a decision to make. Can look towards something like the Tristana, something like the Sejuani. Those are the, some power picks. We've seen Japone in the past play good supports as well. And it will be the Lulu removed by Team 1. So oh. lots of options available here for 1907 Fenerbahce. Interesting, interesting. So Zyra Khan still up and available, but... If 1907 Fenerbahce go for something like the Zaya, then Team 1 can go for the Rakan. They can break up the combo. But even then, we've seen they found answers to this combo anyway. So maybe Team 1 Esports are not that afraid of dealing with it. Interesting that we're seeing a ranged support being early prioritized by Japan. Typically, you would expect either a Rakan or a Thresh to come out as an answer to it because during the early laning phase, Janet doesn't really do that much other than facilitate the training power of your AD carry. And both these AD carries have been prioritizing the Tristana early on. So with Vert locking that in for Absolute here, you do have the option to pick up your support. You have a, a bunch of different options as well. And something we haven't seen throughout this tournament because it's been banned a lot of the time is that Forlan Olaf pick. You are very correct. It is a big comfort for him. He does the hover, but instead he chooses to play more for the team rather than for comfort. He will lock in the engage, the utility, the arguably S-tier jungler in the current meta in the form of Sejuani. And Team 1 already starting to build themselves a pretty solid team fight composition. You would expect their support to come out on the next rotation or they go for a similar trend to what they did in game one and they lock in something like the Syndra. Crash will get his Gragas once again. Seen him play that a few times across the course of this tournament. Very comfortable on it. And it will be the Syndra for Fenerbahce here. So they lock that in for Frozen in the mid laner. Very strong mid laner. And makes Team 1 have to make a choice. Do you go mid pick here? Or do you look towards that Rakan in the supporting role? Ooh, interesting, interesting. I feel like they'd be fine giving away the Rakan because we know Team 1, they'd probably just pick another rain support in the form of something like a Karma. Perhaps just locking in your mid laner now could be good. And then you have that potential for a counter pick with more mid laners available. And that's, that's what they decide to go for. They're going for a bit of a, an aggressive roaming star mid, which is kind of what we expected from Marp. Yeah, 100% what we want to see from Marp. He is the player that's brought in when they want to be a bit more aggressive, when they want to play the map a little bit more. And Team 1 are starting to show their fangs, show us their claws through this first phase. Now we're getting into the second phase of bands. The Cogmore being removed by Team 1. Can take the Zaya as, away as well if they want to really That's hamper what I would expect, Haddon's yeah. pool. That is uh, the expectation. Whereas 907 Fenerbahce, we talked about how the Thrash is considered a pretty good answer into the Janna. I wouldn't be surprised if we saw something like a Rakan band away too with the Alistair already gone. There aren't a huge amount of engaged supports left. The fact that the Cho'Gath has been banned away to me suggests that Team 1 are actually thinking about going for the Maokai here. We've seen how pivotal that pick seems to be in this series. And then they can just first rotate it, take away the Cho'Gath, and it forces Lordran to perhaps play a non-tank in the top lane, something like the Gnar, maybe even the Trundle, which we haven't really seen from him in this tournament so far. Vert is more the, the Mundo and the Trundle player up towards that top side, so he will know those matchups incredibly well. Is the Maokai banned from Fenerbahce, so the Rakan is still on the cards for Team 1 if they want it. They can leave it last if they so desire and look towards top lane here, or they could try and counter out that top lane final pick. Interesting that they would go for the Braum. Now, you have to remember this champion still can give you that all-in potential. It's just a little harder to execute. You've got to go for, like, the Flash, Ulti, Q, set up for the passive, but then you've obviously got the Janda who can be like, ha, no, I'm going to blow you away. Uh, and then that engage from Braum can it just kind of whip. So you don't have as much all-in potential. You rely on additional support or additional CC to get the setup. And then the Braum can maybe follow up. But what you definitely have is disengage with this support locked in for the side of Team 1. And the Twitch locked in for Padden in that bottom lane. Alongside the Janna, that is not a lane-winning lane. Finally, Thordrum will get the Gnar, and we have a counter pick available for Team 1 in that top lane. Now, the question is, does Vert play things like the Jace and the Ken? So far in this tournament, we are yet to see him bring it out, but they're going to bring out the Olaf. 
Sejuani top, Vedius. No, I think it's Olaf top. I friend. think it's Olaf jungle, Sej top. No. Yes. No. Yeah. No. Yes. Surely not. We'll see. We will wait and see. Before All that right. happens, you've got the synergy, of course, of the Braum and the Sedge. Great co stun combo there. Forlan is known for his Olaf jungle. And Sejuani top is not something we commonly see, but it looks like it is what's going to be team one strategy here. Okay, so they have until 20 seconds normally to lock in uh, their swaps and confirm that everything that they want to do. With a few seconds left on the board, it does seem like that it will be the Sejuani top. And this is what I love to see from teams that are from emerging regions that are trying to stamp their mark on international competition. They are confident in their ability to play things that aren't always seen as part of the meta. You've got Sejuani top, you've got Olaf in the jungle, and you have these comfort picks for team one that they are very willing to fight up against Fenerbahce with. Now he has brought this pick out during the summer regular season. And it's gonna be interesting to see how it works because personally, I'm not that accustomed to seeing a Sejuani up in the top lane. Sejuani oh. versus Nar, definitely a unique matchup. We get to experience it together for the first time, Medic, which is gonna be a lot of fun. And we'll talk through how it works out, but in terms of the team comps, you're definitely seeing a kind of 1 3 1 setup from the side of Team 1. They have the double teleport with the LeBlanc. They're going to be looking to try and get an early snowball off onto Marth so that he can roam around the map, start impacting off on these side lanes. Very much what we expected from the player. Whereas 1907 Fenerbahce, they have this cross between big team fighting power with both the Twitch and the Gnar in his mega form while also being able to play on the side lanes, the sneaky pick potential that a Twitch does have. A lot of interesting stuff going to be happening in this game. And already we're off to a bit of a level one shenanigans coming out from Team One. Pushing forward as a five man here, trying to catch out a member of Fenerbahce, but the axe will miss. Ghost comes out from Forlan as well. This is very aggressive. Perhaps thought that Redbird would hit the Winter's Bite there. He did not connect, and so Team One will give up vision at their own red buff and won't get anything for that summoner spell. So the cooldown on his ghost is 153 seconds, two and a half minutes. I don't think he's that concerned about it right now. Popping it early is not going to be the end of the world for him. Uh, he should have it back well, roughly by the time that he looks for his first gank. So he's not too concerned about that. They do get a bit of deep vision from both sides. 1907 doing the same. 1907 Fenerbahce rather, getting that ward down onto the uh, red buff of Team 1. But I feel like, I don't know, Team 1 definitely going to be looking to start on their Raptors rather than go for some kind of sneaky invade. Places to watch this game for us. Vedi is definitely up towards that top side as we see the Sejuani into Nar matchup for the first time at the world stage. And the first time, I'm sure, on many stages throughout the world. Surprised you hadn't picked this one in your picks to watch. <laughs> Would have been a great prediction from you if you had uh, expected it to come out. I mean, the thing about Sejuani is that she's uh, very commonly known as a jungler. And when she first was released, I actually spoke a lot with Zyrene about how she can be an effective top lane champion too. The thing about her passive is it's super obnoxious to break, especially against other tanks. And the four hit passive that she has with her E can chunk out very effectively in the early game and do a surprising amount of damage. Uh, but against the Nar, I imagine that's going to be much harder to execute because he's going to have that range advantage. He can proc your passive literally by walking up to you, getting you to catch his boomerang and then walking away again. So I think that the matchup should still be in favor of the Nar. Early levels, it's just, it's pretty slow. You don't really push that much. But once he gets things like the Phage, that's where I imagine the Sejuani to really start struggling. But as I said, haven't really seen this matchup before. We're going to be learning together how it all plays out. We'll all learn as we go. We saw some aggressive trading from both the mid laners. Is he corrupting potion on Marth? He's only got one stack left of that. And has been jumping into Frozen. You have to wonder how warmed up he is as well. Of course, he can practice backstage, but there's a vast difference between that and playing up against someone who's known as the best mid laner in, in Turkey, the MVP of the split, the MVP of the playoffs, and the best mid laner of the TCL. Quite some accolades to achieve yeah. as coming into Worlds. We, we saw that 
a lot of the play during the playing stage was actually focused around Frozen. We already saw in this series how Fauldron came round to the mid a fair number of times, acting as that pillar that we talk so much about, really facilitating Frozen to be that superstar carry. And I think in this game, there's the possibility for it again. He is playing the Syndra. You can set up a lot of early ganks. But we have to talk a little bit about Crash because he didn't really have the best of game two. Struggled a lot. Didn't have the synergy that we've seen him have before with the team who was getting caught out by Forlan, who maybe it all just comes back to that early play where Forlan was incredibly aggressive and 1907 Fenerbahce were not able to capitalize. Here he's gone a little bit aggressively. And uh, Fallen will get the chase off, but Crash can barrel away. Vert in. There is the flash. Vert's going to follow this up. Fallen has ghosted, looking for the chase. There's the stun. Crash might be caught out for first blood. And once again, Team Watt secure first blood in the top lane. And just as we were talking about him, Crash, you saw on your screen the differences between game one and game two. His early game impact stagnated. His jungle proximity dramatically dropped. His overall performance just seemed to be lacking and he goes for a bit of an invade. He wants to try and utilize the early pressure of Gnar, and instead he gets counter ganked upon. This should not be a surprise now, as every single game, Fallan has come to the top lane to look to try and get a gank onto his top laner. And once again, he succeeds, he refreshes his blue buff, and now he's looking for an invade. Fallan does have the smite. Crash has one of his own as well, so it's just going to be a smite bash. Crash secures it there. Fallan continuing to chase in with that reckless swing and with the undertow. And he owns the jungle at the moment, although Crash was able to secure the razor beaks. So Crash, yeah, he thinks he's fine. Just stealing away some of the uh, Krugs. He's like, oh, okay, I get hit by the Q. That's fine. I'm just going to barrel on out. And then I have to flash. And I'm like, oh, oh, no. Oh, no, they're actually committing to this collapse. You can see the ghosts also come back up from Fallan. And this was just a big overextension from Crash. He thought that with the pressure top, he would be safe to make this play. But because Sejuani got to the play in advance, it allowed them to get a successful first blood, even though 1907 Fenerbahce are still in the early gold lead, thanks to the CS advantages that they built up in top and mid. Seems to be an age-old story for 1907 Fenerbahce being able to take the advantage over Team 1 in terms of CS. But the lane that we have to look at is bot lane because Absolute and Redbutt have a more aggressive lane in this Braum and this Tristana. Forlands on his way down as well. Second to jump in from Absolute as they look for Pad and try to get concussive blows off. He has gone invis. They're going to Japone instead. There's the stun as he flashes under the tower and the heal is used as well. A lot of summoner spells, but here comes the LeBlanc. He's on the back end. Marv is right off towards the side of this fight and will take down Japone. It's just so deceptive, so deceiving that we didn't even catch it on the camera. And this is very much the roaming mid lane that we expected. The moment he hits level six, he moves down towards the bottom lane. He was able to get back to mid first because of his TP advantage. So he pushes in mid, he moves down bot with his jungler. He is now off to that early kill that you want to be getting on that LeBlanc. Team one off to another good start. Yeah winning this bottom lane as well. Let's have another look at how Japon and Padden get caught out. So remember, the thing about Janna Twitch, not really the strongest 2v2 lane. You have the ability to force all in, or at the very least fight with a Brawn. But I don't <laughs> think Marth needed to flash that. I think he could have just walked up. Uh, but he gets the kill. That's what's important. He still gets the kill. Maybe that flash, uh, lack of flash rather, can be punished from Crash. But given that he's already been put behind early, I wonder if he's going to still have the confidence to look to make those same kind of plays. It's always difficult to gank a LeBlanc, of course, because she has got the distortion to help her jump away. Padden decided to go for the Relic Shield start here in the bottom lane, so even a weak 2v2 matchup is made even worse by uh, not being able to have those aggressive stats. Marth once again jumps in, Frozen tries to knock him back, but just trading mana in the mid lane. And I'm glad you highlighted that as well, uh, Medic, because when you're sitting in lane with a Relic Shield and Berserker's Greaves, and then you look across the board and you see, ah, that is a Yordle with a big friendly sword. You're a bit like, ah, this, this kind of sucks. It really sucks. Uh, and that means that they're going to lose so much pressure in terms of the 2v2 that now Team 1 will have so much more control over the Drake. They have the ability to set up for dives as well. And the only remedy, not remedy, the only bright side, rather, for the side of 907 Fenerbahce is that Fauldron is dominating this 1v1. I did wonder why you'd actively pick something like a tank into the Gnar. And I think what we've come to identify is 
the matchup pretty much plays like every other tank matchup. The moment he gets Phage, the lane gets very, very difficult. But that's okay for the time being. He is behind in terms of CS, and once again, we see a collapse here from Team 1 down towards the bottom side. The teleport is going to come in from Burt as Redbert goes in onto Patton. He's got Invis, but they're still looking for this kill. Glacial Prism will connect, and Japone is going to be the sacrifice as Patton escapes. Team 1 once again collapse. And this makes me really happy, Medic. And the reason why is one of the big narratives that we as a broadcast team have had for 1907 Fenerbahce is this bottom lane is a place that you can abuse. It is a place of weakness for the side of 1907 Fenerbahce simply because usually in the 2v2, they pick these weaker matchups, they concede a lot of pressure, and if you just send multiple members down, you can get early towers, you can snowball the game quickly. And what Team 1 have adapted with what we were talking about earlier on, they pick the roaming mid laner. They choose a player who is much more about making plays on the side lane, and they are successfully shutting down this 2v2 in the bottom lane. They'd already set up a ward, as you can see in the Krugs. Martha had roamed down again because he knows the back timing of the Syndra. The moment that Frozen is back in base, that is a big window of opportunity that Marth uses to make his way down, and they get a successful kill and first blood tower once again and that allows them to get Vert out of this lane as well he's losing this lane pretty devastatingly but you can now bring absolute and red bird up towards the top side you continue to open up the map and team one take the early aggression take that early step forward once again they're doing even more this game bringing marf in saying we want a playmaker we want someone who will roam around the map and we need just a little bit more aggression because we think 1907 Fenerbahce can react to our Protect the AD carry composition. Now, 1907 Fenerbahce, they still have a strong Syndra, Frozen. Marf's okay, Marf's okay. But this is what we were just about to talk about, right? This guy, he has been farming away in the middle lane. He's got a healthy 30 CS advantage over his lane counterpart. And whenever Marf tries to be aggressive, Frozen very quickly punishes him, which means that thanks to the pressure they still have in mid, and thanks to the swap that's happened up top, 907 Fenerbahce at the very least can still get something back and considering they have a tower advantage and a three kill advantage this goal is surprisingly close. But this is what we've seen over the course of these games. 1907 Fenerbahce farm better in the lanes. They're the ones getting these CS advantages and because of the roaming from Marth and because of Vert being in a losing matchup that's where the extra gold is coming from for Fenerbahce. Hang on, I know where the extra gold is coming from. It's the support. Of course, it's the support, the gold runes that we've been seeing more and more, the heavy investment in terms of the relic shield. Perhaps that gold difference is a little more deceptive than we initially thought. But you can see now Marth feeling a little bit more confident after being forced back from the trade earlier with Frozen. But ah, look, power spike. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> it's such a play-by-play -play thing to say. It's like, ooh, look at this item. It's shiny. It's an Ardent Sensor being picked up on Japan. The problem with Ardent Sensor, though, Redius, is if you have no damage on your AD That's carry, it doesn't really facilitate you that much. It gives you lifesteal, attack speed, but it doesn't quite give you AD, which right now the Twitch is indeed lacking. Oh, gone for a very early zeal as well. <laughs> he's, he's literally only got all that. That sucks, man. That, that really feels bad as a Twitch. At least he'll attack them really quickly. But we've seen this from Pan multiple times, right? He has been in huge deficits. He was at a 50 CS deficit after the laning phase against HK. And then team fights roll around, and this guy, again, double-edged sword man. One side's a wooden stick, the other side is equivalent to Excalibur, and he will just cut through the enemy team. So I'm going to be keeping my eye on him as the game progresses. It's all about how well Team 1 can now snowball this lead that they've been able to build up for themselves. They've got the power spikes of their own as well with the static shiv having been finished on towards Absolute. Starting to get some tanky items on towards Vert as well. So we'll have to see how much they open up the map. There is an Ocean Drake for them if they want it, but we know they're quite averse to taking <laughs> the ocean. Could look towards mid and maybe set some pressure up there as well. But for the time being, Absolute's going to go down towards that bottom lane. I'm going to see Redbert come towards mid to force Frozen away. And just to try and equalize this lane a little bit because Marf is struggling into Frozen, who has been consistently a carry for 1907 Fenerbahce. Now, this is a little bit of a unique map movement coming out from Team 1, because what you would expect is to send someone like LeBlanc off onto a side lane, because she is the Roma, she is a side lane threat, and typically she will have the teleport available as well. But the reason why they're keeping her mid is because we're still very early into the game. Mid lane is the best uh, resource of just getting immediate gold, because it is the shortest lane. 
And that means that by following experience and farm onto her, she gets to those item spikes quicker. Once she gets the Gunblade, a LeBlanc is way more likely to move off into a Silent because that's where the LeBlanc will feel a lot more confident. Then what Team 1 will do is move the AD carry and support mid and start pressuring this Tier 1 tower. I believe, yes, they do in fact have the Rift Herald and they'll likely utilize that to take down that tower after they've concluded with the Ocean Drake. Ocean Drake and a Rift Scuttler. Look at all of the river control that you can. They secure it for themselves. Still only a 300 gold lead, but we're expecting to see that slowly work its way away from 1907 Fenerbahce. There is a Runans now onto Paddon, so he's got even more of attack speed for us to watch him in fights. But although Fenerbahce might be on the back foot, they are not out of this game at all. They still have a big Syndra, they still have a Twitch that can scale up into the late game, and they still have Crash on that Gregus, one of his best playmaking champions throughout the course of this tournament. Baldrin also has been having a pretty decent laning phase. Very much what you'd expect from him, given his consistency. Trying to join the team now in the middle lane as Team 1. Get a, about 50% of the HP of that tower, thanks to the Rift Herald. And one decided to move Marf into the side lane as they put that Rift Herald mid, so they didn't have a full five-man stack. But they will get some pressure in this side lane. That's what they're trying to do, open up the map a little bit more. We've seen them do it around this portion of the game in the last couple of matches. It has worked out for them at times. Ghost has been used here by Fallan as Vert flashes in. There's the stun. Thaldrin not near Mega yet. Has to flash away. Fallan looking for the chase. And Thaldrin is dead to Team 1. Thaldrin holding on to his flash a little bit too long there. He thought that, you know what? Vert, even if he flashes onto me, he's not going to have enough CC to get the collapse. But Vert very smartly uses the E stack first to apply the freeze. Then he throws his ultimate out afterwards for that double stacking of the root from the frozen passive. So good setup there from Team 1. They get a punish down onto Thaldrin. And that early laning phase now starting to mean less and less as Team 1 have this big solid front line now in the form of Braum. Sejuani and Olaf. The AD carry is farming up nice and healthily, and Marf well on his way to completing that gunblade. And once again, we're seeing Forland step into this role as the guy who makes the plays for the team, the guy that goes aggressive, runs forward, gets these kills. He's been able to help Vert in a losing matchup actually secure a relatively even CS score, and it allows Team One just to open up this composition. And Get Marf in a side lane, get Vert in a side lane, bring the map, spread out 1907 Fenerbahce, and we haven't seen the reaction we would have liked yet out of Fenerbahce. Now remember the win conditions for Fenerbahce, 1907 Fenerbahce rather, are still very much about those team fights later on into the game. Twitch, very impactful team fighter. Nah, in the mega form, can make that game changing ultimate that can swing the fight very dramatically in your favor. And Syndra, she can do a huge amount of damage to that front target. But the question is then, who is the target that you go for? Because it's champions like Sejuani. If you haven't procced a passive and you use your ult into that, well, you're going to do very little damage. Olaf, he's just going to be running in your face. He's not going to be afraid of anything. He's going to try and dive onto the back line of, of Frozen, who is this low mobility mage who you can't CC because of his ultimate. And then you've got Braum with his shield who can mitigate a lot of this damage. So. I'm a little bit concerned for 1907 Fenerbahce. I think that right now they're at such a they're at a relatively decent deficit that would make fighting the opposition very difficult. But I feel like that's the best win condition they can hope for right now, given that they do have pretty good scaling in the form of Twitch. Marf is looking for a catch in this side lane. He knows that Padden's doing the crux. And uh, Padden steps forward a little bit too much. Marf jumps in there, the chains, double chain, gonna land the barrier. Will be enough to root him up. Marf underneath the tower, looking for the kill, but can't quite get it. Padden flashes away and Crash reacts. Fenerbahce able to get the kill, the knockback onto Forlan. Redbird's on his way to try and help out his jungler. But meanwhile, Frozen's coming down as well. 1907 Fenerbahce reacting well. Forlan pops the Ragnarok and the Ghost to get away. The biggest misplay there was Marth missing the initial chain. If he had been able to land it, he would have had enough burst damage to get the kill onto Padden, but he doesn't quite have enough damage. Padden delays his flash for as long as possible. Crash is able to come out of nowhere, and they end up punishing this side lane Marth who tries to build up an advantage. Perhaps a little bit greedy from Redbird there, using the Glacial Fisher across the wall to try and catch out Frozen. We talked about the emotions of Team 1, the fact that they, they play off winning matchups, they play off the fact that they're ahead, and sometimes when you don't get the kill you want, you can try and force the next player a little bit too hard. 
They're now trying to force the mid lane tower, but cannot get it as Padden who have to tap tats down the minion wave. And though he now gets himself a kill. The CS differential is still pretty significant, but he's slowly making his way back into this game and hit that initial chain. Doesn't quite hit the mark, allows the follow-up chain to land onto Padden. Then the flash comes out from Crash, getting the shutdown onto him. And the key thing here is that Padden gets the kill. They also force the Ghost out from Forland, and they just relieve some of that side lane pressure. Very small win, really, for the side of 9207 for Debache, because Team 1 still get that mid-tier 1. But the fact that the gold is still so close, even though there's such a big tower advantage in favor of Team 1, means that 9207 for Debache, I, I just I can't count them out just yet. I feel like that they're still in a very healthy position for the most part in this game. I love that. I love watching people chase the shadow. Just, I'm going to get you. I'm going to get you. And it just runs into the wall. Thor didn't realize that that was a, a shadow a long time before. Vert doing okay in this lane now as well. And Fenerbahce are a team that is so used to playing from this sort of position. Ever so slightly behind in gold. Still with a strong team fight. You've seen how powerful Padden can be. How good Crash can be on this Gragas as well. You cannot ever count them out as a unified lineup. You can't count out Frozen as an individual star as well. He is one of the superstars of this team. Won't quite get the damage down. Meanwhile, on the other side of the map, one trying to take a little bit of a Barney. Vert getting forced back by Thaldrin, who has the Mega coming up. Doesn't want to jump in. Frozen did move towards the bottom side of the map, trying to get a pick down onto Marth, but now he's already regrouped with his team. There's no TP on top of Frozen. And they're all heading towards that Baron. Medica has just spawned. We know how Team 1 was so quick to make the decision to go for it in Game 2. Their eyes are set, and 907 for Nabachi, they're still slow to react. They have to react because at the moment, Team 1 with a 1-3-1 comp with those double teleports will utilize this Baron to great effect. Crash in the wings, waiting for his opportunity to jump in, but he's not back. 1,000 HP, the Baron goes down to Team 1. They jump out the back, they'll sacrifice Forlan, but four members will get away with that Baron. And once again, Team 1 sneak away the Baron. 20 minutes into the game, no hesitation. They see Frozen in the bottom lane and they punish it. The teamwork coming out from these guys and the calls from Forlan to go for the Baron, take the risk and make the gamble work is what allows this team to catch 1907 Fenerbahce by surprise once again. Fenerbahce trying to take what they can from that loss. They will get two towers in the mid lane. They even out that gold score. But it's so even there. But Team 1 now have the opportunity to really spread into these side lanes, really utilize this double TP composition. So again, look at the minimap. You can see the Syndra still in the river. It's difficult for 907 Fenerbahce to get the fight, but also the fact that the Braum Shield just soaks up so much of the damage coming out from the spray and play. It means that 907 can't get into the pit. They cannot commit to the objective and Team 1 walk away with the Baron, and as you rightly said, on their split pushes, which is so important when utilizing this objective. You've got an Infinity Edge and a Static Shift finished on your Tristana as well. She will melt towers down. That's the first turret that's fallen alongside this Baron buff, and there's a Dragon on the cards as well. If they want it, it looks like it's going to be an Ocean for Lan. Going to secure that one for the team, and Team 1 are showing us why they can put up a fight against these higher level teams. They struggled in their group. They weren't really able to overcome Cloud9, but here against Fenerbahce, they are showing us just how strong they really are. Fenerbahce probably showing us some of their weaknesses as well. Padden forced behind in lane, slowly catching up a little bit here. This all the time though, man, every time. That's the thing about Team 1. They have done a pretty good job, but when you have to go for a gamble Baron, that's not the most reliable way to take advantage of your lead, but you have to praise them for recognizing an opportunity and taking it. This team, they did it in game two, they're doing it again in game three, and now they're grouping up bot, and they're looking for a fight. Knocked back onto Redbird, Crash will get stunned up with concussive blows, he's down to half, Japone trying to keep him alive, he will survive for the time being. As now Padden just opens up that spray and pray, Marf jumps in to get the kill on Crash. And that is exactly what you want from your aggressive mid lane. Bit of a questionable decision there from Crash to try and engage onto two of the tankiest members of Team 1. Teleport's still up for Vert, and now you can see he's back at full health. They're waiting in the base 
to see if they can go for a re-engage. Some of that synergy lacking between Crash and perhaps the rest of his team. He was looking to bring Redbird, to bring Vert into the squad and perhaps be able to burst one of them down, but they just don't quite have the damage yet. Frozen is still sitting on that unleashed power though. And with a finished Leandris and Morello Nomicon, he will be able to melt through a target if it's one of the squishier members of Team 1. Double adaptive helm completed as well for Team 1. Get a help against the Syndra damage. Along with the on-hit damage, funnily enough, from the Arden sensor. Um, very minor, but it's there. <laughs> uh, also, you'll see that the Banshee spell has been completed by Mark. He's in a pretty significant CS deficit, but it's going to be really valuable, especially when he looks to try and make picks like this. Now, you can see that engaging onto, again, a Braum and a Sejuani when there's a Tristana just sitting at the back, dealing free damage, probably not optimal, and Crash melts so much faster than Vert does that Man's not really, a Pan, sorry, is not really able to get a kill. Then Marf just comes over the wall, gets a very quick pick. But unfortunately, it doesn't really result in any objective, it's just a single kill. And you could argue that Crash's life is what allows 927 Fenerbahce to keep the tower alive, which is great, but. At the same time, he did just kind of give away his life, so. But it is a weakness we've seen from Team 1, which is the capitalization on having this sort of minor lead. When they're miles ahead, they can win the game, but sure. when it's only about a thousand gold or so... They gotta take risks. Yeah. They are a team that likes to take risks. They so we've seen two 20-minute barons from them. We've seen some very aggressive plays from Forlan. That's the sort of thing you want to see. Marf and Forlan duoing, combining, getting some aggressive plays off into the enemy. And the Sejuani top so far has been working out pretty well. I love the way that they sent all five members to the bottom lane. They were like, let's get him out of the top. Let's just send him bot. We're getting an early first tower. And Team 1 have maintained control over the majority of the map. But again, 1907 Fenerbahce, they're still scaling up. Frozen has been doing very well in the mid. 25 and a half minutes into the game, 256 farm. This guy is, in fact, ahead in gold over Marth, who has three kills. And that just goes to show everyone at home even if the enemy mid laner is snowballing, you can still have value as Frozen now getting collapsed upon. Well, trying to get the damage down. Here comes Fordham running in with the Ragnarok as he tries to roll over Frozen, and that will be a dead Syndra. The Unleashed Power not enough to take down the Olaf in return. Classic cast of curse. The moment you praise a player, uh, he gets caught out. And now with him dead, Team 1 could look to try and take the top tier 1, but very quick response from 1907 Fenerbahce, and then Team 1 respond themselves. Absolutely, and Redbird just sitting in the mid lane. We said we wanted to see Marth and Forlan be aggressive, and because they are aggressive, Absolute and Redbird able to get a trade off. Bird is just trading straight into uh, Thaldrin here. Thaldrin's going to be the, the rock of this team, and he's getting collapsed upon. He's getting taken out by Team 1, and Thaldrin, when your foundations collapse, your team collapses. Fenerbahce needed him to be solid at the moment. He's looking anything but. Baldrin has not had the same sort of impact in Game 2 or Game 3 that he was able to have in Game 1. We look to him as being one of the players that really sets up his team for success, truly being that catalyst. And we're seeing the struggles that 1907 Fenerbahce do have when he's not in a position to do that. They don't have that same synergy with their jungler like they normally did with Move. Japon and Padden normally play this more reserved style in the bottom lane. So many expectations are put on Thaldrin to be that key player. And now he's one and two. He's playing the Nah. He's not a big split push threat right now. He's on a potentially big game-changing teamfight champion, but I don't know if 907 Fenerbahce are really in a position to teamfight, especially now that Team 1 have built up a pretty significant gold lead. 3,000 gold ahead with Baron up in only nine seconds. They can set up vision around it. Want to see these control wards. They've got six of them in their inventories. Want to see those used. And they've got great deep wards in the base of Fenerbahce or just outside the base of 1907 Fenerbahce as well. Love the play coming out from Team 1 so far. These guys, again, were not expected to be the favorites in this series. Many people touted that the Turkish representatives would be the ones to overcome Brazil. But Team 1, they learned from their Game 1. They're riding off the momentum of Game 2. And they pick comfort picks again with the Olaf and the Sejuani. They bring in Marth for more of a roaming mid laner. And, and they're just looking confident. They're looking strong. And now the pressure's on 1907 Fenerbahce to, to truly find a way back into this game. And 
maybe they can get one big fight. That Twitch is on three items. He does have an on sensor. He could, he could be exactly what the team needs. He could be the hero to make up for the lack of foundations. It's what Padden has been throughout this tournament. His fighting in team fights is so exemplary. He actually has a KDA in team fights of 11.5, a devastating number. But Crash now once again is at that front line. He's getting collapsed on by Team One. There's the Clutch of Fisher. Absolute is going to jump forward as well. Vert looking for the flank, the knockback onto Frozen. Crash down to half, but he's surviving for the time being. Vert runs in with a righteous glory. That's a quick pig. And Crash goes down so low, but manages to survive. And now Vert is knocked back. Fallout from the side, but Vert will be the first to fall. Marth is in the bottom lane here. He teleported down to that lane. He's looking for an in here. Now, normally what you'd expect from Team One is their good ability to utilize side lane pressure. They commit a little bit too hard to that fight. They see blood in their eyes. They think we can punish Crash once again. He has been one of the big weaknesses for the team so far in this series, but he baits them to overstay. They're able to get a kill down onto Vert, the big tanky frontline in the form of this Sejuani, and they're able to get themselves a kill back. So keep your eyes, look, you can see Crash. They want to try and shut him down, but the positioning of Han is key. You'll notice him just sitting on the back line, no real threat right now. He has the support from the Janna as well. Yet he doesn't quite unload the spray and pray just yet. But once Vert flashes over the wall, that's when he knows he can start to unload. That's when he knows they can get the collapse down. But again, unsurprisingly, Team One are rushing for this Baron. They know Thorgren's down towards that bottom side, but they do need to be cautious because, of course, Marth does not have his teleport. We'll see. 1907 Fenerbahce forced them off the Baron. Marth is still down towards that bottom lane. We've seen Fenerbahce come back from deficits before. So many times against Hong Kong Attitude through their playing matches, they were behind. They were two, 3,000 below behind. And catches like this is what could win them the game. Vert caught out by Crash and by Frozen, but Borland is looking for the chase in here. Marf is on his way up. Here comes the TP, and Borland's overextended and knocked back onto Vert as he jumps across the wall. But Japone's going to flash forward. Absolute still alive. Japone as well, but here comes Marf from the backside. Can't quite kill. The Janna, Doldrin's looking for the chase onto Burt. Team One still running away, they have to escape. Crash has a flank, but instead they're just gonna go for the bounce. The jungler is dead, there is no smite on Team One. They go for this risky play and they're not prepared to answer the aggression from 1907 Fenerbahce. Let's see if Marth can stop this. Marth jumps in onto Frozen, the root lands, but there's the cleanse, Absolute dodging around the side. There's the Baron, goes down to Fenerbahce as they look to engage onto Marth and Absolute. The flash away, the buster is great. And Absolute and Marth will be able to survive the knockback, the scatter of the weak. Marth jumps across the wall with that flash. Team One, they're just not willing to give anything up, but Fenerbahce do secure that Baron. Team One have had such great control over the majority of this game, but they go for a Baron, and Vert makes one bad decision. He goes over the wall without vision. Forland then commits. He thinks that we can fight two versus four, and he gets obliterated. Frozen is still strong, level 16 on this Syndra, and he just rips through that front line. Absolute isn't there, Marth isn't there either, and because they go for this bad fight, it allows 1907 Fenerbahce to be the ones to punish the mistake. They're the ones that now get the ban, and now you have to move your eyes back to Pan. This guy is now working towards his fourth item. This Twitch is getting to that late game stage where you start to shake in your boots. He has the Iron Sensor on the gen. He's going to be extremely difficult to kill. And the team fights are starting to look like they will go in the favor of 1907 Fenerbahce from this point forward. On the other side of the rift, however, you do have Absolute on a four-item Tristana. You Very do true. have strength. You've got two Knight's Vows there as well. You've got a big... LeBlanc, 50 CS behind, but the further you get into the game, the less that CS matters. As the gold is pretty much even between these two teams. Fenerbahce get themselves a Cloud Drake, and are looking to secure a tower as well. They are two turrets behind, and Team 1 are just going to have to try and hold on to their base for the time being. Team 1, they're still at a healthy gold point. As you rightly identified, they're still very strong. This game is by no means over, still very, very close. It is just 1907 Fenerbahce that have the pressure, thanks to the Baron, that they've been able to pick up. Let's see how well Team 1 can hold as the siege begins. We have to see how well the big players can step up for both teams. Look at Thordrin, look at Padden for 1907 Fenerbahce, look at Forlan and Marth. They're the ones that make the plays. Thordrin's going to jump in, looking for that Mega. 
can't quite get it yet. The inhibitor tower, the new target for 1907 Fenerbahce, 2,000 gold lead. And they are unrelenting, unwilling to give up the pressure that they have exerted on Team 1. Look at how difficult it is for Marth to get onto a flank. There's so much vision off onto the side as well from the side of 1907 Fenerbahce because they know that Marth doesn't want to engage head on. That allows Frozen to just nuke him out of the fight, especially with his Banshees now gone. Team regroups, they're going for a siege. Straight onto Frozen, the Unleashed Power comes out. Marth down to half, but Frozen's low as well. Here comes the Glacial Fisher, they've caught it onto Crash, and once again, he's a bit overextended, but a great Monsoon will knock him back. Team 1 unwilling to stop this pressure, fall and knock back. He will survive for the time being, as will Bert. But now Fenerbahce trying to turn this one back on its head. Marth with a flank, can't quite connect. And the Inhibitor Tower remains standing. But so close, such clutch fights. I thought Crash had overextended. I thought he was going to die, but then Japone was there to save the day. Team 1, they couldn't quite get onto Padden either. They tried their very best to shut him down. Fallout soaking up the brunt of the damage, but neither team ends up dropping. Team 1 with a great base defense. They hold on to their tower, and now the game resets. The Baron is gone. Two hyper carries on both sides. Big tanks on either side, but the biggest difference is this Uncensor on the side of 1907 Fenerbahce, but also this mid lane assassin in LeBlanc. She becomes so much harder to use as the game goes on. Because if you can't find that opportune flank, if you can't get onto that key target, your value in fights is significantly less than that of the Syndrome. And this is the moment a substitute proves their worth. This is the moment where you say, Marf, we brought you in for this game. We brought you in to play this LeBlanc, to play this assassin. We brought you in to do a job, and that job is to kill the enemy backline. And if you can't do that, you are not worth bringing in for the next game. Wow, that's a, that's a little extreme, Medic. If he can't do his job, get out of the kitchen. Gonna mix all of my metaphors there. All right, okay. Perhaps it was slightly extreme, <laughs> but in my opinion, if you're brought in to do a job, you don't do that job. Don't deserve the I role. think you've got to bear in mind that he did have a great early game that's too. True. That is true. We'll get, that's uh, part of his job. He did part of his job very well. Yeah, I think his job gets a lot harder. And you're right. They did bring him in. He is put on the responsibility of playing this LeBlanc and eyes will be on him in these later game fights. But I think it's important to remember that it's hard. <laughs> it is very hard to play the LeBlanc in these late game fights. So we'll see how he does. Right now he's off on the top lane. He's aware of uh, 1907 Fenerbahce grouping up in Team 1's jungle. Knight's Vow used onto Padden as well. Here comes the teleport in by Bert. They're looking for the flank. Forland going in with the Righteous Glory. Marth down to half. The Unleashed Power does not take him out. Here comes the counter TP from Thaldrin. And now Team 1 have to decide, do we dive? Do we go in? Do we risk our lives in this final fight? They say yes, they go for Padden, but Forland is already dead as his Bert. Two members of Team 1 down. And 1907 Fenerbahce are able to get the kills. Team 1 a little uncoordinated there. They weren't sure if they wanted to commit or disengage. Five members of 1907 Fenerbahce are now onto this tier two tower, and they could very well break into the base of Team One. 4,000 gold ahead. Now they have a two-man advantage for 30 seconds. Marp still looking for that flank, but look at the damage that comes out from Padden. 303, basically completed build as well. Only sitting half an item away. Fenerbahce will break the base, and that inhibitor as well. Will they go for more? Is the big question. It looks like they are resolved to back away for the time being. Haddon. Haddon. Here he goes. Absolute. He's the team fighting god, but Redbird puts up the wall and says, you shall not pass. He flashes away. The Glacial Fisher will knock out Padden and Absolute, and Redbird will not quite survive as he gets taken out at the end. They might want to try and end the game right now, Medic. They're not going to, Benny. They're not going they, to. They retreat. They say, now that Vert and Fallen are back alive, we cannot finish it off. They see the Baron spawning in 30 seconds. They realize that if their base siege fails, then that allows Team 1 to just rush that objective down and get back into this game. We have to backtrack because remember that it was Team 1 in control for the majority of this game. It was Team 1 that were finding these great picks. But Marf, he is not the same LeBlanc that he was 20 minutes ago. This guy tries to go for a pick onto Padden. Things looked great. But then look at the heal from the Warlords. Look at the barrier coming out from the Twitch too. And this is where things fall apart for Team 1. Because Absolute can't really get involved in the fight. He gets knocked back by a great ultimate from Crash. Fallan is committed to the backline by himself. And he is a tank. He's not that full damage Rek'Sai anymore. 
and he ends up dropping. So 1907 Fenerbahce have been finding these consistent fights, but at Team 1, they're going aggressive once again. Going for the flank once again, onto Crash, looking for that stun, can't get it. Knocked back, Haddon with the flank, look at him, he's the team fight god, he's the carry for this team. Borland oh, is shredded down, he dodges the Glacial Prison of Adam is a god, goes unstoppable, kills the Olaf, and is now looking for that mid lane in him. Excalibur has been drawn, and he is cunning his way through Team 1. Padden comes out huge in these final fights, 5-0 and 3, and they've got their eyes on the base of Team 1. Marth trying to keep the wave around, but Crash is more than willing to tank this one up. That will be the second inhibitor tower down. 1907 Fenerbahce with a 8,000 gold lead as well. And Team 1 just not quite able to capitalize when they needed to. Now Padden is online. He's drawn that sword and he says, come at me, my man. I will shred you and I will cut you down. And it all comes back to that play that Marth made down in the bottom lane, trying to get that kill onto Padden. When he got that kill, think of the experience that he got thanks to uh, the kill onto the LeBlanc. He closed the gap. He got a bit of extra gold. He started making his way back into the game, and then Team 1 did not choose to continue to put down the pressure. 1907 Fenerbahce will get their second Baron of the game, while Team 1 will answer with an Elder Dragon. They do have the double ocean. This will still be a strong advantage to get. The question is, can they get out? Absolute has jumped up, but Redbird is the one that will be targeted down. Marth then jumps around. He will realize that Padden is waiting in the wings. Redbird caught up by Thaldrin. Support is definitely going to die. Marth is trying to escape down towards the bottom side. There's the Glacial Prison. Padden dominating. 6 0 3 on this Twitch. 1907 Fenerbahce are looking for that final inhibitor alongside the tower that guards it. So look at Marth. He is getting in the way of those minions, trying to slow down 1907 Fenerbahce. They say they don't care. They will take down this final inhibitor. Now they have their eyes on the nexus of Team 1. Two towers remain between 1907 Fenerbahce and their second win in this series, between them and being one game away from the last 16 of Worlds. Both these regions, both Turkey and Brazil, have been so close to Worlds. Have been there a couple of times and both these teams will want to prove that they deserve to be amongst those names you know Besiktas, Supermassive, INTZ, some big names in the history Kaboom. of emerging regions. Kaboom. How could we oh, as Europeans forget them? I wish we, oh, well, we'll say Pain as well because they beat CLG they and did. Flash Wolves so yes, they did. Albus Knox, Luna beat us both, CIS region of course but the emerging regions demonstrating their ability on the international stage and I feel like that both these teams have shown a lot and it, uh, we are guaranteed to have one of them in the group stages of the World Championship. They're guaranteed to go up against some of the powerhouse regions. And it's going to be exciting, especially with these performances. Team 1 have demonstrated that their early game is pretty strong when they work together. But just like HKA, they couldn't quite keep that lead going. They went for a few risky plays around the Baron area. And 1907 Fenerbahce have been that team that have successfully punished those mistakes. And now there are only two Nexus towers along with a Team 1 team standing in the way of that Nexus as they go for another fight. Once again onto Crash, they will slow him down. But Dodger's there, the Nah, that's what you want from your foundation of your team. Padden opens up, he's spraying and he's praying for more kills. It's a double for him. 1907 Fenerbahce will flash in for these kills. Mar falls back to the fountain, Bird falls back to death. And now 1907 Fenerbahce can close out this game. The Quadra. quadra kill for Padden. Give him his second penta of worlds. He doesn't oh, get it. Jeff steals it away. <laughs> There's a kill secure for you, Benny. It's as Fenerbahce secure the Nexus and secure a 2-1 lead. The smiles on the faces of 1907 Fenerbahce. They wanted to give him the penta, but Chapone, he did do a lot of work this game. And he said, you know what? I deserve some of the credit too. That's what supports do, you know? You do all the work, you don't get any of the credit. Sometimes you just have to take away a penta on the fountain to close out a game. But such credit to 1907 Fenerbahce. They fought a long, hard slog to be able to come out on top of that game after Team 1 looked pretty dominant early on. Very back and forth series. Things were looking great for Team 1. I, I felt like that it was going to be difficult for 907 Fenerbahce to be able to come back. 
but the moment they saw that first Baron go down again, they were like, we're not going to let this happen anymore. They were able to answer the second setup of the Baron from Team 1, and then Virtus, he went over the wall, he wasn't expecting an entire team there. If Forlan had just left, they would have still had that jungle threat, maybe they could still go for the seal, maybe they could still even challenge the Baron. But because he commits as well, because you send two members into four, 907 Fenerbahce have just said, well, okay, we'll take the free kills, we'll take the Baron. And you have to give credit too to players like Frozen, who even though Marth was roaming around the map, getting a lot of kills, he was always staying up on his farm. He was making sure that the gold was close, thanks to his ability to just keep up in the CS game. And just across the board, Fenerbahce as a team just unified so well oh, as they came later on into the game. Played their composition very well as well. We're going to send it over to the analyst to hear about how 1907 Fenerbahce brought this series to match point. Medic, they came back hard. They came back swinging. I think it's safe to say that Fenerbahce were pretty impressive, honestly. Coming back in a game where Team 1 were in control for 90% for of it. Yeah, credit where it's due for them to come back and hit those team fights, and ultimately they put themselves in a position where they may still lose the lanes. Marf was everywhere on Summoner's Rift, but Fenerbahce still came back. They still team fought exceptionally. They got to those item breakpoints. But now the thing that we wanted to talk about coming into this is pick and ban, because once again, Different, a lot of different we have, things. We have left reality. We have entered the world of the off meta. It's a very scary, dark place, but we have arrived. We have the Janna first pick with Zyra Khan up, untouched in the pick ban phase. We have Sejuani flexing up into the top lane versus Anar, so you can put an Olaf in the jungle. Sejuani ends up losing that lane, down 50 CS or so, despite getting a gank early. We're in a weird spot. Yep, and I can't really slight 1907 Fenerbahce because they won with it, but you still look at this and it's like there's no Zaya Rakan and they just, they first pick Janna. And you're like, okay, no worries. Team 1, they've got the duo now. They can pick them both at the same time and it didn't happen. They went for the Sejuani and the Tristana and the Sejuani. But one guy I feel like we have to highlight, as good as Fenerbahce played, definitely... Once again, a little bit of loss in lane, but Marf did come in swinging. We were wondering how he was going to do, and it did feel like he had a lot of presence in the early game. Yeah, I mean, he, he still lost by about 20, 30 CS, but the same thing was happening with Brewster, and at least Marf this time was able to get on the map and find a couple of plays. He got down to the bot side a couple times, helped blow up that laning phase of the Twitch and Janna, who were actually losing this time around. Patton, uh, I think this was the first time in the series he's, he lost laning phase by CS, so this was a, a big difference for him. On the flip side, the top and mid are, are winning pretty hard. Ultimately, this does culminate in Team 1's kind of sneaking a Baron away, and we can take a look at it in this first replay. Them rushing this Baron feels like we're the first time where they had this super tangible lead. While they were ahead in kills so much of the game, this was the moment where I felt like they were in control. Yeah, this is the first big point in the game where it's not even just so much a sneak as doing it kind of Barche aware. They still will take it, and the call is to just exit the area, and you know, everyone except for the Ghost user of the team is going to be capable of doing so. The risk is always of a steal in this situation. That's a big concern, but obviously not in this case. And the reason for me why these are such important plays, these Baron forces and these kinds of things, is because on average, they're down 1,500 gold at 15. Uh, this is for team one. And they have a team kill at 0.5. Uh, so it's, it's really not close. Uh, and the reason they're so important is because the coming late game, they need to have some kind of advantages. The team fights that they pick are after they already have the Baron. They're not winning a fight and going to Baron. It feels like they can't really match 1907 Fenerbahce's team fighting. So the fact that they're able to, you know, find a Baron for free to give them goal leads, it's why they are able to win game two. And it's why they were almost able to win game two. And the scary thing is you talk about those deficits, even in this game where they were ahead in kills in the early game, they were up 200 gold with three kills. Mm -hmm. So everyone else is falling behind. And yes, some of that is going to be the ancient coin from the Janna, but at the end of the day, you when you are getting this many kills in the early game, you should, first turret too. You should yeah. be in I, blood. You yeah. have to be in control of your lanes too. It has to amount to more. And ultimately, as we got later and later, suddenly the Twitch and the Janna are a lot more of a threat. Suddenly that ancient coin and that Arden sensor are starting to pay off. And we can see Fenerbahce now able to find a way back in the game via this Baron. And of course, a lot of this kicks off with not knowing where Fenerbahce were when you look at the vision. So 1907 Fenerbahce just are able to pick off the Olaf, pick off the Sejuani. Suddenly the tanks of the team don't exist. And this is that three item point in the game where you look at it and it's okay. Twitch is pretty online, and from this point, if you win a team fight with the Twitch, you actually just start to snowball the entirety of this. It happens around Baron. Yeah, there's, there's a team fight right before this that they lost. They weren't able to use uh, Marf's pressure in the side lanes to actually get anything. He missed quite a few of those chains, not able to convert on the chain grabs, so he was falling apart a little bit. And then once the gold lead finally went in Fenerbahce's favor, it was completely over. It didn't feel like one had much of a chance. And if we go back to the draft, a lot of this does feel due to the picks that they put together, right? We look at a pick like Olaf. We know for Forland, 
fantastic pick. We saw him super active in the early game, but when you get into late game fights, this champion's a DPS check, and let me tell you, Twitch wins DPS checks. That and the fact that, like, in order to get this Olaf, they had to take the Sejuani earlier to keep it off of Crash's hands, and you're putting your top lane at such a disadvantage just to get some jungle matchup that you want or some advantage there, which, which I, I, have, I have trouble seeing because, yeah, late game versus Twitch Janna, you have no chance. And looking back at this again, when you highlight the draft, I still feel like the Sejuani should have just stayed in the jungle. They could have picked that top lane matchup instead of giving Thaldron CS advantages, even if you can camp the lane. But now we're towing the line, right? Because we talked about comfort picks being important, but when, when, is, when is it too much to tunnel on comfort picks? When are you overvaluing the Olaf in, in a lot of these circumstances? If, if you want to just take the Olaf, I'm fine. You can save your top pick for, for last, and, and you can, you know, just counterpick. If you take the Sejuan to then, then still just counterpick mm -hmm. topside. It's better than giving yourself a disadvantageous matchup just to deny the Sejuani pick. I draw the line at when you're sacrificing the rest of your team to empower yourself, right? And that's what this game kind of felt like. By having to put the Sejuani top lane into a Nah, you are sacrificing top lane strength to empower your Olaf, and that to me is too much. Yeah, and when we look at one final replay, we can see what happens when you get that late in the game, when you see that the Olaf is no longer quite as effective. And we see here on the top side, but we have to praise, I think, the patience coming up for Fenerbahce, despite falling behind, the fortitude mentally that they put up to, to keep it together this long in the game where they could actually find an advantage. You see half health Patton is jumped on by Forlan and Vert, but they actually don't kill him at all. They instantly get melted by that Twitch. He's back up to full health just off the lifesteal, the Ardent Sensor, and it's really hard for the rest of one. He's forced to join in on that backline. That's one of Olaf's problems is that while he can always reach his target, he doesn't necessarily have that follow-up. Marf had gotten chunked out earlier at the start of the fight, and you see once they get that flip in the goal graph, it's completely the other way. Makes you kind of wish that there was a Corky in the middle lane instead of something like the LeBlanc as well. The Talia, which is going to be banned in this case, of course, by Team 1. Something that can still be consistently dealing damage that will scale nicely into the mid and later stages of the game, where the Twitch can't just completely handle everyone and take over, because you've got the two tanks running at the Twitch. Of course he's going to kill them, but he killed them way too quickly. But pressure is now on as we move further in this series. Team 1 in a tough spot. It's time for them to step up. They want to participate in the group stage. We're going to see if they can bring this series versus 1907 Fenerbahce to a Game 5 when we come back.